Welcome to this month's GPS training podcast. It's our 53rd episode. This is another special episode because I'm joined by a good friend of ours, Chris Howard. And um, people might recognize Chris, well, you know him more as Chris the Coast Walker. We had Chris on our podcast back in July last year, just before he's setting out on his 11,000 mile trip around the coast of Britain. So welcome, Chris, back to the GPS training podcast. Hey, John, thank you for having me back. Um, a little bit sooner, because actually, if people are watching us, you're sat at home, which was kind of a little bit early, unless you've managed to walk around Britain in 142 days, which I suspect you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been good going, though, wouldn't That it? would have been very good going. So, yeah, why are you sat back at home um, rather than walking around the coast of Britain? Yeah, sadly, I, um, I've been affected finally by the coronavirus as well as everybody else, you know. It's just one of those things. I made it all the way to Northwest Wales. I got to Aberystwyth, and, um, which is actually a good thing. I got there and um, I checked into a hotel for the first time in, I don't know, four or five weeks. My wife booked me a Premier Inn because my friend was coming down on the 23rd to walk with, uh, sorry, 21st of December to walk with me for a few days. And that was the following day. And then um, she booked it for me and for him. And I hadn't told my family, but I was going to come home with him on the 23rd and surprise them for Christmas just for a few days and then straight back to Wales and carry on. However, I checked into the Premier Inn. It was about half past four. I and was think. this on the 19th of December? Was this so you yeah, checked in the right. night that Wales closed down? That's right. So I, I checked in about half past four. And obviously, you know, it's been weeks since I've been have had a shower or anything. So I just took all my kit off, threw my bag down. I jumped in the shower. My wife texted me as I was jumping in saying, just there's an announcement being made. Can you put the TV on just so that you you see the announcement? And of course, it got to five o'clock. I was in the shower and I could hear it in the room. And uh, I jumped out of the shower, dried myself off. And it got to the end of the announcement. And there must have been a clip which was less than five seconds. And it said, and from tonight, Wales would go into lockdown from midnight. I then had, yeah, six hours to get out of Wales. And um, thankfully, Aberystwyth is the only mainline train station in that part of Wales. However, that in itself is a bit of a weird one because it's only got one platform. It's only big enough for two carriages. And uh, I, I had the shortest hotel stay I've ever had. I'm glad I got a shower, but I literally got dressed again, stuffed everything in my bag, ran down to the desk, checked out, ran to the train station. And as I got to the um, ticket booth, there's no ticket office, there's just a machine. So I had to pay through the machine and, and I couldn't go to London because I wouldn't get to London until after midnight, which means I would have been stuck in London. So I had to figure out a route quickly and go to Shrewsbury and then from Shrewsbury to Birmingham, then from Birmingham down to Cambridge. And I got my ticket and as I got the ticket out, hundreds of people came around the corner <laughs> obviously all with the same problem as me and then I knew it was a bit more serious I managed to get home anyway and my children and my wife were very happy I don't think they're as happy that I'm still here nearly three months on <laughs> um, <laughs> but it is what it is and I plan to carry on as soon as I'm allowed I thought I'd just be here for a few weeks I honestly thought that um but obviously the situation, as everybody knows, it got a lot more serious very, very quickly. So you'd, um, you'd walked 142 days at this point, or you'd been out for 142 days. How many miles had you covered um, by the by the 19th of December when everything went pear-shaped? I, I haven't worked it out exactly, but I'm close to 4,000. Okay. So right. still pretty good going. Very good going. That's really good going. Right. Okay. okay, let's go all the way back to the beginning. So we know where we are now. We know why we're talking to you um, at home rather than actually walking around the coast of Britain. So you've done 142 days, approximately 4,000 miles, but it all started back in July. So if people haven't listened to the podcast back July, you go back and we'll have you can listen to the pre-chat. But Chris started walking from Norfolk, which is where you near where you live. Um, yeah. But what date did you start in July? Do you remember or not? It was very close to the end, I think 28th or 29th of July, something like okay. that. Okay, so you started from home, end of July, and you aimed to walk around the coast of Britain in one year, remember rightly, wasn't it? That was my aim, to finish in a year. So, how many miles did you end up covering 
day by day? What was you? What were you aiming to cover, and what did you eventually achieve in, in this 142 days to date? So I managed to average a marathon a day. Um, some days I, I was able to do upwards of 30, so 30, 32, 33, and then I did a very long day, which is the longest day I've ever done, and I, I don't really want to repeat it. But I did a 40 miler, and um, I, I just, uh, I, I really needed some days off after that. But the problem is. I haven't had days off like a lot of people approach it and they'll walk for a week and then take two days off or they'll you know go for three weeks and then take a week off or whatever I've just consecutively walked a marathon every single day for that 142 days so you you've how many days off you must have had a day or two often you over that 142 the days, only so. day off was going to be the day between me checking into the hotel and my mate coming and that was going to be my rest period <laughs> i only hope chris i hope your wife paid the premium premier in fee so you can get your money back did she yeah. <laughs> thankfully she got our money back um, oh, and and she was doing that whilst i was trying to figure out how to get home <laughs> and what the hell i was going to do you know but it it kind of all worked out in the end um, Your only day off in a luxury hotel and well in a Premier Inn hotel and uh, suddenly you have to bail yeah. out. It's just typical, isn't it? Really? Yeah, but I guess the compensation is that I've been able to spend the whole period recently with my children doing homeschooling and, and really being present with them and um, engaged with them again, which is it's been fantastic. Um, you know, other hotels are available as well. It's not just Premier Inn. So. <laughs> They won't be saying a premium when you see the price of the are post lockdown. I don't know if you've, I, as somebody who spends a lot of time in premium in hotels, oh, uh, I've had to downgrade because I'm not paying over £100 to stay in a premium. <laughs> yeah, in, I guarantee yeah, yeah. you that. Can imagine. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so 26 mile a day, 32 miles a day, consistently day after day. So I saw a number of days you were really testing yourself a physical side of things. So actually, you had some days where you didn't eat all day and you didn't. Drink. Why were you doing this? Is this just a moment of insanity? I know you've kind of got this. Yeah, sadistic well, it kind of. To you. <laughs> it kind of went back to that previous podcast we had that, that in the beginning that chat, and I think you asked me a question about you know how are you going to adapt in different places, going to be more remote and things like that. And in my head, I looked at my route and where I started, and I planned that each next stage was kind of training for the one ahead. Um, so you know, North Coast, Norfolk is really flat then getting down to Kent and along to Dover and stuff it's a bit hilly but that's going to train me for the Jurassic Coast and then further down into Cornwall that's all going to train me to get into Wales and then in theory Wales would have trained me into getting into Scotland and, and a bit in the lakes um, and that kind of was the theory but um, I also thought the further into Scotland I get the more northwestern areas Cape Wrath that kind of area they're going to be really lean days at some point you know they're so remote i don't know if i'm going to be able to restock supplies i'm going to have to forage more um i'm going to have to get my body used to taking on very little but still expending a lot so um yeah i decided to document some real test the test days where i just i went without water without food completely and the discipline alone to just not give in to that feeling of just a sip of water would be all right um just just pushing yourself hard it was mentally training as well as that kind of physical side. And was it easier than you thought it was going to be? Or is it, as you say, is it just mental training? Once you've got your head around it and you focus on it, it's it, you just get on with it, is it? It is a bit like anything you do. If you, if you can really engage mentally, you, you can really discipline yourself and just get through it. But, you know, I've got a lot of respect for people that fast. And I don't, I've never really dieted in my life. I it's not something I've ever needed or wanted to do. But those people that go on fast, 24-hour famines or longer, I, it's quite a profound feeling to forego what is your normal option of food and, and intake of water to then suddenly you've got just the bare minimum at the end of the day and you really, really appreciate it. You know, And it doesn't matter what it is either. Mm. That food is just fuel, but you really enjoy it, even if it's bland as anything, because your body is just craving nutrients and craving that kind of recompense so what did you eat at the end of the day so when you when you hadn't ate or drank anything a day was did you treat yourself or was it just your normal rations at the end of it because it's <clears throat> the end of that day i got to a place um somewhere near fairing i can't remember now but um there was thankfully a shop uh, there's not much else because that part of the coast it's kind of uninhabited 
uh, but there was like a it, it was like a spa or a premier shop or one stop or something like that. I can't remember. Uh, very limited in terms of its supplies, but there was uh, a fridge with you know um, drinks and stuff. So I managed to get a pint of milk, which bizarrely I just guzzled. It was like a really yeah invigorating fresh pint of milk. Um, I got some orange juice. I mean, uh, <laughs> I think it's the first time I had some chocolate in weeks or months i got one of those um they marvelous millions bars or something they've got like little bits of smarty and then little bits of turkish delight and also it's amazing uh but yeah and some proper carbs as well like i had and did you feel your body just come back into life that's why did you feel literally over literally half an hour suddenly you kind of you, you the sugar rush the whole energy coming back into it's amazing what food does and and how when oh, your body's so uh, low how how it, it just revitalizes you doesn't it really yeah yeah absolutely and i'm not a big chocolate or sweet kind of fan anyway but the thing that my body craves most is fruit juice and fruit and that natural fresh kind of product and that's that's a bizarre thing in itself because at home here like and before i it's not something that we have regularly and it's not something that i go out to get it's so it's just, it's a very quick way of getting those nutrients and sugars into you. So it's natural sugars, isn't it? That's what you're craving when you're, when, but I suppose if you've been walking yeah. all day long and you've not drank or ate anything, that's what your body is wanting, isn't it? Immediate rush and it's getting that from the natural natural juices. That's it, yeah, yeah. And and I think the other thing I learned is um, quickly, try not to overeat too quickly, don't gorge, because suddenly you're going to have this crash and it's just going to make you feel bloated and lethargic and of course I've still got to walk again the next day no matter what test I'm giving myself I've, I've still got to go and and keep going um so yeah it, yeah so that's I kind really, of maybe teaching you that actually when people are walking long distance we should be eating little and often rather than actually eating your two or three meals a day or even worse as you would do I know you're doing it for a different reason fasting and then gorging at the end of it no we should be eating you no know, six uh, uh, well is this what you were finding you no know, eating six seven times a day rather than eating you no know, your three staple meals as such yeah so i regularly would um would find that i i could completely forego food if needed if i if i had a target in mind that i needed to get to and um i just needed to push on then i could sacrifice the food till later but and i think that's interesting people don't realize what their bodies are capable of you've got a lot of fat reserve whether you're skinny average size whatever you, you have fat reserves whether you know know it or like it or not um your body works in a certain way and it will use up all of those reserves before it kills you off you know um so you are capable of doing a lot without a lot of calories but what i was finding is that i didn't want often people would offer me things like fry ups in the morning like cafes would get hold of my story and say oh come here we'll do a photo outside and you can have fry up and stuff and it's not that I'm not grateful, it's totally amazing, but it's not the thing you need to walk on. Yeah. It just makes you feel heavy and lethargic. So I'd be regularly eating, you know, I'd be walking along and as long as I could eat it whilst walking, that was key as well. So things like dried mango, um, perfect. It's lightweight in the bag, uh, just a, a small hand-sized portion of nuts or raisins. That's once a day. And it just kept going like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, very few snack bars. Um, I had a sponsor who produced snack bars and, this is another sad fact of the pandemic, but they've kind of gone bust. Uh, well, they haven't gone bust. They've been bought out, which is good for them. Yeah. But they never wanted that. And so, but I, and so I always had one of these little, um, it's not even Mars bar size. They're quite, quite, you know, sort of like, I guess like that size, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but they're really dense protein calories and then all natural stuff. So it's good. Um, but yeah, regular and often there's no, it's not, um, you can't just sort of sit there for lunch for an hour mm -hmm. and, uh, and have a massive meal and then expect to go again. But I said, if you're walking, you wear no over 26 miles a day, you do need to keep going at it. It's not something you, you need to kind of, you, it, as you say, you can't keep stopping. So you, you're stopping every t 10 minutes, every hour. You're suddenly putting on an extra two hours onto your day. Well, you don't need that, yeah. do you? You need to keep going at it, don't you, really? That's right. And especially like going into winter and even, you know, right up to, when I finished or when I ended in Aberystwyth my days were much much shorter than when I started yeah you know e even waking up at five in the morning still it wasn't making a difference so I'm waking up in the dark cold wet most of the time setting my tent down clearing my gear away getting dressed and going and I, the last thing I'd want to do is sit there and boil up a cup of tea and have a bit of food I just want to get going 
And if I could do that by having some nuts or some dried oats or something, great, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, you, and then by kind of four o'clock, you're looking for somewhere to set up again because you, you can't, you can't keep walking. Exactly right. So, going back to those early days when you first started walking this distance day after day, you did have a few leg problems, didn't you? Do you know your body took a, a fair bit. Just know we had a bit of correspondence uh, via Facebook Messenger or something like that because you, you, you had leg problems. Was this really right at the start? Wasn't it, I think. Yeah, do you know, I knew this would come up, John. <laughs> I remember you talking about it and asking why why am I not taking poles and should you be taking them? And is that something you're gonna learn? And then <laughs> so yeah, in the first few days, I I, I um, exacerbated a previous running injury in my left knee. And I actually thought at the end of those first few days that was gonna be game over. I thought I, and in my head I just kept thinking it can't be. You know, people know that I'm doing this. I can't just back out after a few days. It's... So I pushed on, and I, and I think on the third night, I'd taken something like four painkillers up: like ibuprofen and paracetamol, glug loads of water. I put some stuff on my knee. Nothing was changing, and I thought to myself, just purely from water intake alone, I can't continue to keep taking painkillers this way. I've been taking them all day. I've taken them the day before. If I'm going to be taking them tomorrow, it's going to start affecting my kidneys. I, I don't know where I'm next filling my water up, for example. So I've really got to be conscious of what I'm doing. And so I decided um, I'd be able to keep going if I could manage the pain and start getting the legs stronger. And what I noticed is every night I would set up in my tent, I'd lie down on my back. I always tend to sleep on my back anyway. But your body has these natural mechanisms to do things you don't necessarily want it to do so like you know imagine my feet uh, down in front of me like that well my legs do that naturally I think most people do and what that was doing on my left leg is it was twisting the tendon towards my knee and putting pressure on it so I, I needed to find a way of keeping my foot upright like that all night and keeping it stabilized and so I ended up for about two weeks strapping my leg to my backpack in the night just to keep it stabilized and that sounds really weird and, you know, I, th I think if a farmer had come along and found me and sort of chased me off the land, it would have looked really odd with me hobbling along with my backpack tied to my leg. But um, so I called pogoing, is that sure my age? Used to pogo in the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so um, after a few weeks of doing that, things started to get a bit better. And then I, I then enhanced that by strapping it. Um, I picked up one of those neoprene type straps for the knee. And... Um, I basically wore that every day since week two, but by the end of week four, week five, maybe, I had very little pain. And then I tested it a few days without the strap. I could notice a dull ache after that. And I thought, right, let's keep the strap on. And I just kept being disciplined with my stretching and kept being disciplined with stabilizing that leg. And even now I'm conscious of it. It doesn't hurt, there's no lasting damage but I'm conscious that the body is, it will just do things you don't want it to do. So you've got to be thinking about your form and, and how you sit, you know. Did that leg get better? Because you did lose weight. I'm not, you, you, you weren't big, but you did lose weight over those. You only lost a stone, is that right? Did you lose more? Yeah, I think I've only lost a stone, realistically. I'm, a, I'm amazed at that. I thought you would lose, you no. Know, far more than that really but and has that made life easier for walking losing that stone or not really it hasn't really affected me because as, as you say I, I, I wasn't a big guy particularly anyway I'm, I'm stocky and my legs are probably where all the weight is generally mm -hmm. um the only thing I would say is that in the beginning where it was so warm in the summer um I you know your backpack strap that the hip belt that rubbed continuously to the point where I just had raw skin on my hips. And, um, uh, you know, it, it was a couple of things. Probably I was carrying that little bit of extra weight there, but also the moisture and it being hot all the time and then strapping back up again the same day or, you know, keep going like that and it's just repetitive. But the skin kind of toughened and got harder. I kept them clean and that was fine. But, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, now I've put on a little bit of weight since coming home because we had Christmas and all the chocolates and things and Easter's coming up, but I haven't put on a lot more weight. I'm not back to what I was when I left, so. 
I just wondered that help your leg. Walking really. and running every day, you know. Exactly right. Yeah, I just wondered that would help your leg really because losing that weight would take that extra pressure off. No, but again, little, yeah, yeah, it would. But it would I still help. never used poles, you see. Mm. <laughs> and I tell I, you that north coast of Cornwall and the southwest coast park in total without poles, I probably wouldn't advise anybody do it without poles. I mean. Well, when I meet you in the uh, in the Lake District, Chris, I'm going to loan you some quality poles and I'll walk with you. You can see how it improves your walking technique. Uh, I, okay. I honestly, I, I'm 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 amazed that you've walked that distance. I'm I'm absolutely dumbstruck, actually. <laughs> that you've, that you've, yeah, because I, I I'm amazed how much how much make it quicker it makes me walk and how much more I don't know upright you don't fall over you don't stumble especially when you're tired and things like that sure so. yeah, yeah it's funny because a lot of people that have come out to walk with me or met me in certain places and come to walk they've had great big backpacks mm. and poles and all sorts of them and uh, and they look at me and my backpack's relatively small i've just gone up a size now but and i don't have poles or anything and they're like how are you walking so fast like, because I've, it's all i've been doing yeah. for a hundred odd days yeah. it's, there's nothing else in my life it's yeah that's brilliant right best walking so far which was the best section of coastline that you've covered so far so people don't know you're walking clockwise so from um as, as you've already kind of described the route so far so you can come down across the bottom round land's end and then back up or back up you kind of skirt quite a bit inland again and then back round into wales so which is the out of the uh the fourteen thousand miles that you've done so far four thousand miles sorry that you've done so far um, what's the best bit of walking then you know, it is all lovely, and I know people want to pin me down on that, and it's really hard. I don't want to upset any particular area. I'm going to come people... to the worst, the worst one next, Chris, so we'll upset the people next. We've okay, got the okay. best one to start off with. We'll but, to the okay. worst bit. I think the thing is, um, partly because I'd never been there, but also because it is so naturally stunning, It, I just cannot get over and can't get out of my mind how amazing Pembrokeshire is. Right. Um, it is just it's out of this world like it's like being on a different planet sometimes um yeah beautiful so Pembrokeshire coastal path is the one to walk oh, the least favorite section of coastline to date um part of it's also in Wales the Carmarthenshire side before you when you go up the estuaries sort of to Kidwelly and Ferryside and stuff it's interesting but I, I think when I was there the weather was particularly bad i think it had 20 days of solid rain that in that section and i'm sure it's pretty when it's not raining but i just i didn't even want to pay attention to the view at that point mm -hmm. but i'll blame that on the rain alone the worst section for me is parts of kent actually um and it's kind of inner city parts where you come back out towards the estuary and go through Sittingbourne and places like that and i'm very familiar with those areas because i grew up there um i've got friends and family around that area all the way from sort of Gravesend round and down towards Whistable and Tankerton and stuff. That section is nice, but the, the bit towards that, it, yeah, it it's really, it takes a bit of getting used to, because you are back on normal roads and it's not just a road alongside the coast or the estuary, it's a road that's going through a middle of a town that backs onto an industrial estate and it goes down paths that are very rarely used. So you end up, it's almost like you're hacking away with a machete to get through brambles, you know, um so yeah i think that section of the kent coast is it's not as much fun saxon shore way they call it right okay okay the nine things you've learned about you your body and your mind so i've got three things so i'm going to do three you three you your body and three your mind so three things you've learned about you over the last well over the 142 days to date that you have walked what have you learned that you've learned about you and to be honest, you've done this before chris because I've, I've spoken to you before you're a thinker you're not somebody who's just walked every day listening to the gps train podcast i would advise that for people but you, <laughs> i know myself when you spend a lot of time on your own walking you've got a lot of time to think so you've thought of this so come on you've, you've you've been ready for these answers ready for these interviews so three things you've learned about yourself over the distance to date I have learned about myself that I am capable of being far more patient than I am in modern, normal life. So um, patience is that you've got patience that you didn't know you had before. You've learned that patience comes, yeah. Absolutely. And I think from that comes tolerance and all sorts of crazy good benefits, you know. But I'm not just patient with other people. I'm patient with myself and less harsh to quickly criticise myself. Um, 
so I, yeah i'm more patient with my own understanding and learning i think that's that's one you next you is next me is i it, it is the physical thing i am very very capable physically and i've started to think that you know when i set out i said i'm i'm just an ordinary human and i am but what's amazed me is how capable we are as human beings and it's given me a real understanding of what i'm capable of on very very little um, but i suppose that also ties into the last thing which is your mind because actually that a lot of that is physical because actually with the greatest respect of enemies water 100 days solidly physically you're going to be up to it whether you start off not in that state or not but actually it's the mindset that you've managed to build up which yeah. you always had to be honest ever since i spoke to you you're not just you've always had that mindset of i'm going to do this and actually i'm not going to fail at it but, but that's but i suppose that's maybe got stronger so you've talked about your patience you've talked about the physical side of you that you've learned about it what's the third physical thing that you've learned about yourself um i think the other thing i've learned about myself is that i naturally should be and perhaps we should all be in an environment where there's less noise and chatter in daily life i function much better as a human being and and as a person and i mean as a dad as a husband everything in life i function much better when i'm out on the path because I'm the best version of me. I'm calm, I'm patient, I'm all those things, but apply those to my children and my wife and our relationships are so much better. And even when, though we're apart, when we are then together, everything is much more emphasized and heightened and, and more, yeah. So by you remove that clutter from your life, the day-to-day -day rubbish that is yeah. totally, you don't need, you prove that because you've been away for so long, you don't need that day-to-day -day rubbish actually therefore you yeah you you're a better person for not being distracted by that yeah rubbish. absolutely and i know that's difficult for a lot of people to understand because you know you need to go to work you need to earn money you need to provide a house you need to feed them the right food and clothes and this that but all of that builds up and builds up and it just becomes this great big pressure pot in your head and i get that uh, you know i felt that and out there that doesn't exist so you're allowed to be free again and mm -hmm. i think that's it very good right what three things have you learned about your body your body over those you know, 142 days today what three things have you learned about your body i definitely have learned that my body will do what my mind tells it to do uh, and in that it comes um down to pain management as well you know my leg is a prime example so many people i spoke to friends um other people that i've met contacts that were keeping in touch with me said you need to take a few days you need to go and see a physio if not a doctor blah 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 but i knew in my head if i'd gone to see a physio or a doctor they'd say you need a few weeks off or you need to stop this now or what that was never an option in my head so keeping going and having a focus is something you need up here for this to follow you know otherwise I think you are in danger of just giving up. You know, it's amazing when you say it's actually, it's amazing what your body or anybody's body can do. do you know, you say this, though, when you, you're, you've you slept for a month with your leg bound to your other leg to keep it straight, as you say, anybody twists their ankle or falls over, right, I'm going to sit with my, my I'm going to sit and put my feet up on the sofa and have a, a week off work to recover from it. Because that wasn't an option, you worked through it. And actually it just shows your body recovered when you were still giving it the same um, chips, of, um, poor word, but the same work that it was doing, it broke in the first place. Yeah, um, and this is the interesting thing for me. So I, I have actually started writing a book, um, not just about my journey and the experience, but it's sort of based around the evolution of walking and what it can do for us, what it has done for thousands of years for us. Um, I don't think people realize how important it is to walk. And I, I hope the lockdown has made people get out there a bit more i know it has but you know it's one thing to walk five miles around your house or whatever or, or around the area you live in go and walk a 50 mile stint or go and walk for six days in a row or whatever carrying your pack you'll suddenly feel completely different you'll feel more energized your body will be clear i had a friend come out and walk with me for three weeks who's always had sinus problems suddenly no sinus problems he's gotten he's not clearing his nose four or five times a day in the morning he's totally clear he's not snoring where he used to have what like they call sleep apnea 
mm-hmm. waking himself up because he snores that loud, you know, all gone just from being out in the fresh air and in the open and walking every day. He lost a bit of weight. Sure, that's going to have a benefit and that's going to impact it. But this just goes to show, isn't it? What do we value? You know, that's right. That's exactly right. How did you find walking with someone then after you've been walking on your own? Did you find that hard or? Yeah. Do you know what? Yeah. I, um, it, was, it was tough because you become this um, disciplined, focused, routine driven thing that just is totally connected and immersed in the world around them. And it is your world. You know, that's it then somebody else comes into it screaming and kicking and punching like a newborn baby. And brings um, that clutter back into your life as well. Like you yeah, mentioned, distracts bit, yeah. actually comes with this small talk of clutter, which with the greatest respect you've, you've stopped and, and disassociated yourself with that. And then you come back with the, the, the small talk of the, you know, the, the BBC news notifications and this kind of thing. Yeah, I'm not interested because actually yeah. I just want to walk and enjoy the scenery. That's, that's exactly right. And it took him a little while to sort of get his head around the fact that, don't need to be looking at our phones or next notifications you're here not away you're away from work and that world this is this is all in front of us mm-hmm. we should be immersed in it and enjoying it you know and appreciating it but in the end it was a really great experience I've never spent that amount of time consecutively with him and I think we, we're stronger friends because of it I think he learned a lot too and I certainly learned that um as yeah, part of probably that patience that I, <laughs> I've learned as well uh, and that's nobody's fault. It's just it, it is the, the way it was, you know. Good. So going back to your body. So it, your body will do what your mind wants it to do. Anything else you've learned about your body? Yeah. Um, I think you can be as strong or as fit as you like. You can go to the gym, pump as much stuff as you want and get those muscles to look pretty. But the truth is your body will do more than you think anyway. And I don't think it's often very good that you just go and train certain muscles to look good i think the body should just be an average what and and i guarantee you someone walking the way i'm walking their legs are probably stronger than someone that's in the gym doing quad curls or whatever they're called or squats every single day um, because they're capable of going the distance and and your muscles rely on the things going through them yeah i i'm just so surprised by how strong and resilient it is Fantastic. And your third and final thing that you've learned about your body over the distance. So anything else that you've learned about your body? And then we're going to move on to your mind. So I think you're very much body related. This kind of links to that last bit, but um, I'm surprised at how quick it is to adapt. You know, just um, in, in every respect. I mean, I wear um, glasses for reading and watching TV just like you. Um, I always have pretty much. When I'm walking, I don't wear glasses. And in fact, whilst I was on my walk, the only time I put glasses on was when I got on the train from Aberystwyth to come home. And my eyesight seems to have improved. And now I've since done some research with spectators about um, how walking can impact your sight. And it's actually proven it reduces chances of cataracts, does improve long distance sight. That's an incredible feat for the body to to do on its own, it's, it's improve eyesight just from walking. You know, my heart rate is far lower coming home from the walk than it ever has been when I've been running regularly. Mm-hmm. That's insane. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it just, it, it's an amazing it's, thing, the body. It is that, yeah. That, but yeah, it's that general well being. Your overall fitness, even compared to your running, your overall fitness must be. 10 times greater than it's ever been in the I last think so. few years anyway. I think so. And so I think the key um, that on the last point about the body is that really for me, where I've always thought you've got to be strong in the leg, you've got to have strong arms and you've got to do that because of dis- different disciplines like rowing and rugby, you know, you need those strengths. What I've really learned is actually the key is to be strong and supple. You don't have to be overly large. You don't have to be overly strong. You just have to be fit and a bit flexible and you'll get through anything. That's right, brilliant. And then the final things on um, the nine things you've learned about your body, your mind, and you is your mind. So what three things have you learned about your mind um, over the walk so far? I've learned about my mind, a few probably varying 
things. One I want to say is about not always thinking of the situation or yourself too seriously. I think having the ability to switch from oh my god this is a catastrophe like this is a, an insane thing that's about to happen to okay but let's do something else or let's try this you know there's regular times when I've fallen off the coast path or had some accidents and fallen over or whatever there's one in um Cornwall I fell off the path completely because it gave way from underneath me <laughs> and then I had I grabbed onto a uh, like a gauze bush that was the only thing I could reach to grab and, and then of course I had hundreds of these tiny spines and spikes in my hand my arm and um it started throbbing because well that's what would happen but um yeah and I just I, if I sort of in my head I thought what am I doing my family would never have known if if I hadn't been able to grab onto that gauze bush where would I be now like what, yeah. what what's there's the serious side to this and there is but when I calmed down I looked back at it and I looked back along where I'd come from and seen how far I was going and where I was going to and it's and I just remembered that most people don't get to experience this and you know I'm learning stuff here and I'm able to use this stuff mentally to persevere and I'm able to be positive about it so maybe I should just laugh up, laugh it off and carry on and and in the end that became a revelation because just being able to look back at a dangerous situation and say was all right it wasn't that bad but i think sometimes you need to be in that awkward dangerous bad situation whether it's mentally or physically and then when you move back into your normal life or or normal back to walking actually that suddenly becomes easier because actually you're not falling off the cliff because <laughs> yeah so you have to have the trauma in your life to kind of come back into it um yeah to have the, the and then realize actually what you thought was hard work or traumatic actually is not traumatic because actually i've been somewhere which is a far west place which is potentially you've fallen off a cliff and that nobody would ever find you for weeks on end so, exactly so you, you you then build on that strength thinking that actually what i'm doing now is actually quite easy really because i'm not at the bottom of a cliff and potentially dying or yeah kind of much worse than dying and, and i think it's a bit like you know soldiers and police officers and paramedics go through that kind of whole thing where they decent if they've got a dark sense of humor because they desensitize themselves to to what they go through on a daily basis you know um yeah so so any any well other two things on your mind um was isolation a good thing being on your own was that a good thing because again does that help your mental state or does that do you tear yourself to pieces in that state? Yeah, that's a strange one because um, it's weird. I like my own company and I still quite like my own company. <laughs> but um, <laughs> for some people, I probably wouldn't recommend the isolation. It's really tough. And some days it gets very, very lonely. But, you know, the mind is so strong. I found myself <laughs> when I was approaching towns on seaside areas where, or coastal areas that had big, bigger towns or a small population, as soon as I saw people again, I had to remind myself to stop talking to myself and that social etiquette still exists. Because your mind is that powerful. It's not even a conscious thing. It will just keep you reassured by going into this automatic chatter or, and it'd be just about nothing, you know? But it's really powerful. Did you miss sharing your thoughts and experiences with other people verbally? Um, I'm, I am I'm missed, I, I think it's, I don't know if it's a regret, but one thing I um, I do I think about that is that I, I um, wish I'd been able to see a lot of this with my wife because I talk to her about it now and she's very excited to hear about it. And, you know, she's um, still very supportive and everything, but there are bits of that I know that she, not just that she would love, but that I would have loved seeing her love, if you know what I mean. and. Yeah, there's a lot of those experiences that I miss missed that opportunity with. Um, and did you think that when you were walking with it, I would love to be sharing what's what's your wife's name? Sorry, Abigail. Abigail. Did you a lot of time with you? I would love to be sharing this. Abigail. I wish Abigail could be experienced this with me. I wish Abigail could be experienced in this this viewpoint or yeah. whatever it was. Yeah, absolutely. And so I'd always try and take a photo of that particular place, and I'd send that through to her at the end of the day or whenever I could, you know. But, um, mm -hmm. Anything else finally for your mind that you've learned to, um, over the distance and 
time on your own, really. Has so it been the, beneficial overall for for your mind or your yeah for your mind has been beneficial? Oh yeah, like I, it's weird. I think you have to. I now think you have to train your mind and practice with it the way you train your body to do something. You, you know, it it's such a powerful tool and uh, it's capable of amazing things. Uh, but also just removing myself from the situation I'd been in and having that freedom to be present and mindful of the things around me, it's not only opened up lots of doors and different opportunities, but it's unlocked a load of potential for me up here. And it's made me see things completely anew, you know. I totally agree with you. Do you know, somebody does walking, it's for me personally, the, the mindset of that long distance walk is, is the key thing. So as you rightly say, the physical side of thing, frankly, there's not much you can do about it because actually if your leg breaks or if your leg, that, that's you, that's you, you know, yeah, over time you physically build up, but that mindset is just, it is that, you know, being in the zone, just being focused on achieving this and actually mm -hmm. breaking it down as well, isn't it? Because actually you sit down at the start and say, I'm going to walk um, this 11,000 miles around the coast. Actually, it's, it's not it's not a manageable thought. Actually, it's, it's you know, thinking, oh, this is, this, it's not ridiculous, but you can sit there going, but actually you break it down, right, today I'm going to do this mileage, today I'm going to push myself and do 30 miles or whatever. Yeah. You have to, for your mind, otherwise you get overwhelmed with 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 things don't you yeah i think though john you know you are a walker and you're you're used to using gps and things like that as well and so you know like setting a challenge like that it it it, it feels less ridiculous because you're you but it a lot of people i've met have turned around and said why are you gonna do that what what do you mean that, no <laughs> well, it's it's funny i don't know I, I, you I, you've been doing other things but um my a good friend of mine interviewed me on my own podcast um, this year because I did a I did a walk, long walk. If people don't know, they will know because I listened to the podcast. I did a, a 62 mile walk in 22 and a half hours. And my friend Paul, who interviewed me, met me at five o'clock on the first day. And he says, John, I've never seen you so much in the zone because I was just like, right, I'm here. I'm click, 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 click. And actually he said, you know what? There's no point in me being there because actually, do you know what? You you weren't even aware I was there. And I wasn't aware. I was aware I wanted my tea. I wanted to have 15 minutes. I was going to get on and go walking again. And, and yeah, is that mindset about you don't the bigger picture, which was like 62 miles, is is just overwhelming. But actually, do you know what? 13 miles, 26 miles, 13 miles, 26 miles, 30 miles, 26 miles. Actually, do you know what? It's achievable. I feel like I've got another 30 miles and they get a snack at the other 30 miles and I have my meal or whatever. Yeah, and, and that 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 mindset is totally. And I was the same. I, I didn't want someone telling me what was going on at whatever. I didn't really care. I just wanted to walk my thirteen miles, really. And how how did you feel at the end of your walk, John? Because I remember you telling me you were going to do it. Mm, I'm gonna. Yeah. Um. This is. Um. It's not really about me. This, but I'll I'll tell you. <laughs> so, um. Yeah. I, I felt. Yeah. I'm going to do 126 miles this year. So that's uh, yeah, in two yeah. days. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to try and do in two days. Uh, yeah, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, amazing. As you, that's why I mentioned talk to you is going through those periods where low points and high points, you know, those points where I, I thought this is not going to happen. Like, like I'm struggling at this point. I, yeah. I saw how I, I, I started off well with my diet. It, 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 it I, I then stopped eating because I was just tired. I stopped drinking because I was tired. Um, lived solely on the adrenaline. The adrenaline then stopped. Um, I felt physically sick. I then <laughs> ate, put my head down for an hour and felt better and, and, and felt really quite physically. I felt very, very good about it. Um, but it, yeah, but I, I, did, I did very well. I, I was very ahead of where I needed to be. So actually, I, I, I had aimed to do it in 24 hours and I, I, I was well ahead. No, I I was well averaging over three miles an hour, and and with my poles in my hand, uh, <laughs> and yeah, it, and I kind of I, yeah. Once I got over that, no, I've done twenty six miles. I'm ahead of myself. I, I I've thoroughly relaxed. Those first 13, 26 miles were quite hard. Of like, am I going to get? Am I going to do this? Because a few friends had tried the same thing and failed. Yeah. Um, but again going back to your mindset is it completely changes your mindset like Done. therefore it's with thursday well is it thursday, thursday today i'm going for a walk on saturday a, a quiet walk for me is now 20 miles yeah exactly yeah <laughs> so actually 
if people watch our series of GPS, I do a walk and talk series. I go and do a 17, 18, 19, 20 mile walk on a Saturday because that's, that's what I do. I, 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 you do have to be a bit careful though, because in my experience now, um, it's become an isolating thing because nobody wants to walk with me anymore. <laughs> you see, yeah, and I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I had two friends who walked for a section with me and I didn't walk with them. They walked on the day, walked and talked, and I walked behind them. And I, I, yeah didn't want to talk to them really because actually i was doing my walk so because yeah. <laughs> so it is an isolating thing i think that's a fundamental thing but actually you you as a person doing the distance need the isolation because you need that mindset to that's concentrate right. you need to control your 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 treat my treat for me is i'll listen to a podcast at two o'clock in the morning i'll work towards that and listen to my podcasts you know my treat mm-hmm. is that hot cup of tea at four o'clock in the morning whatever that's that's what i'm aiming towards i don't really care what's going on around me yeah and it's um, those small things that become massively appreciative of isn't it like yeah it's and it's those simple yeah it's just simple things that you're back to basics aren't you? what's the basics is no you need to eat you need to drink you need to go to the loo and that's it yeah yeah, yeah. what else do you need in this world <laughs> well that's it i could quite easily happily live out on the coast path just yeah. i'll just keep going i think <laughs> that's it's just going back to those basics and yeah i think it's quite fundamental really so anyway moving back to the, the <laughs> so i know on the trip a, a number of people help you out you talked about the person who offered you a cooked breakfast and this kind of thing so tell me some of those stories about people who kind of spontaneously you met or or yeah. have helped you or i think i read on one of your facebook posts was it a local book club or something that took you in <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. all extreme really wasn't it the brightling sea booklets um there was this all female group of uh yeah women that um that have a book club in brightling sea and uh oh, it's amazing because um and let's you know there's so many stories like this over there let's, let's do this let's do the three acts of random kindness that you can remember so it's over like let's think the the best three acts of random kindness that have you've appreciated over those 146 days of walking so in third place chris is uh, or do you want to start at number one i suppose it's easy to start at number one is it is it probably easy to start at number one, um, number one i'm is. gonna go with brightling tea and the booklets because it one random act of kindness snowballed into a bigger thing, like a whole night of amazing good stuff. So I arrived in Brightling Sea. I don't know anybody in Brightling Sea, and you have to get um, a foot ferry from Point Clear, which is um, just after St. Osif in Essex near Jaywick Sands. Mm-hmm. And it's literally a three minute ferry over to Brightling Sea. And because you can't walk it at all. And uh, I'd never been, didn't know what to expect. I stepped off the boat, got a message from a lady called Tammy, Tammy Saunders, who's still in touch with me now. She's amazing. And um, she had been affected by meningitis and she, really badly. Um, but um, she wanted to help. She had an empty chalet cabin type thing and said, you can use it tonight, totally fine. I said, that's amazing. I met her and uh, she came on her scooter thing. And we were chatting away and she said, what are you doing? It's amazing, blah, blah, blah. We had a really good chat and we got on very, very well. And I I think because she'd been through a big trauma and I'd been very isolated, we had this very instant connection. And it was the best conversation I'd had the whole walk because we were very open and honest, just like that. And it clicked very, very nicely. And and I, I think she will be a lifelong friend for me um but not only did she give me this use of this chalet for the night which meant i could have a bath which was amazing um she uh, said that they normally meet this group this book group normally meet to read a book at one of the huts on the beach the beach huts uh, they all have one but they alternate between whichever's and then um, they didn't have an author to come and speak to them because of COVID and would I be interested in coming to meet them all uh, and I said well yeah sure and they said and it turns out actually it's normally their night to go swimming so you're swimming off the jetty and and I thought okay yeah all right that sounds cool so I dumped in my gear and then we met up there 
and they had tea and cake and stuff and we were swimming and it's a, it's a beautiful place Brighton is here it's one of those shocking gems in the middle of Essex that's like how did I know this never existed you know um and so that quickly went on to the women talking to me and chatting about different things and it was all amazing and that not only did they donate and follow me all on social media and whatever within maybe half an hour of meeting them they had contacted several local pubs, bakeries and restaurants and managed to get me fed, watered and supplied and treated like royalty for the night. It was amazing. Um, not only that, when I got to the restaurant where I was going, the manager or the lady that owned it came out and spoke to me and she said, um, would you mind if the chef came out and talked to you? I said, no, not at all. It's fine. He was the youngest head chef in Essex, I think. And... Um, he grew up in care and children in need had paid for a lot of his catering qualifications. So it really came back round full circle and it was just the most incredible experience. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we're still in touch as well. So. Quite humbling, really. I think I can see that in your face. Really, you can really. Kind of just, something just escalates and suddenly you kind of go, wow, this is just the pinnacle. Again, meeting the chef and thing was just been the icing on the end of a great couple of days. Well, a great day, really. You know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, and yeah, I'm very lucky to have met them all and um, to experience them. And, and knowing that they're actually quite close to where I live, I know that I'm going to go back there and visit them at some point. So. Fantastic. So that's number one. Number two, the random rats of kindness. Number two is, this is awesome for me, like, and it's made me feel great, but the random act of kindness has come from my influence and it's somebody else that's done it. And that, is what's amazing so i was on this walk and i also part of a rowing club back home i'm on the committee and i'm a coach at a rowing club here i think i told you that before but um there was a junior committee member her name was zara and um she just turned 18 i was already on my walk and um i'd been in touch with her about different things she does a lot of social media stuff and she was working on an internship for this company she was supposed to go on a gap year and then COVID happened, of course, she'd paid to do all of that, but couldn't go. And the plan was that she was going to go on the gap year and then come back and go to university after that, whatever. Um, but all her friends went off to university and then she was stuck here, not on her gap year, but with nothing to do, living with her mum and her sister. And I think it was getting her down quite a bit. And um, we were chatting away and uh, I said, well, come out for a walk with me. And then... Um, she sort of, I could tell she, you know, she's a young girl and she had a lot of self-doubt and, um, but she's a really nice person. And I've spoken to her mum and I said, look, come, she can come out for a walk with me for a few days. And what I'll do is I'll give you our route and our locations and I'll tell you where we're going to be staying both nights and I'll book places so that you don't feel anything's, you know, weird or whatever. <laughs> so her mum was appreciative of that, I think. And they, they came and met me in North Cornwall, a place called Crackington Haven. And to be fair, she hadn't anticipated, and I hadn't really anticipated, but it was going to be the toughest two days in North Cornwall. You know, the ascents and stuff were just unreal. And um, within the first couple of hours, she had to stop and have a little word with herself. So we had a little chat on the bench and had some water and I said, look, let's get this kit off you. Take your bum bag off, put it in your bag, um, get this underlayer off, put, take your scarf off, this, that, and that, just because you're going to get hot and stuff so this will be the plan from now on we'll do it this way and we'll just go steady we're not gonna you know push it or anything and i think she was just a bit upset with herself anyway it all turned out fine and she did brilliantly and i think in the two days we did push him 40 miles and i know i normally would do more but i had someone with me you know and i think that's pretty impressive for a girl that's not done this sort of thing before and then so she goes home and I carry on walking. And then a few weeks later, I get a message to see if I'm all right. And she says, so, so I was thinking I might, um, I want to do something. That I, I'm, I'm thinking about going, like quitting my internship. I said, okay, well, that's, that's probably a positive thing because of the way they treat you and stuff. I said, yeah, um, I'm thinking of going to volunteer in a hospital in Uganda. Wow. And I was like, really? She said, yeah, I, I just think I could do with a bit more adventure. And I, I want to do it. And her mum was been texting me saying she would never have done this would never have done this if it wasn't for coming out with you and boosting her confidence and 
And so that made me feel amazing, mm -hmm. but even more amazing for her. Mm -hmm. And now she's out there and like, she's sending me photos and videos that's of awesome. her time. And that, that's just brilliant. That yeah, random yeah. act of mm -hmm. kindness of mm -hmm. her to be so selfless and go out and, and help help in a hospital is just that's just amazing. That kind of sums up everything that you're doing, really, is actually, and we've discussed this a lot, is actually by doing something that's completely outside your comfort zone everything then becomes achievable doesn't it and i think that's what she saw she was actually in this in this wormhole of this is going every day have you have a great time i'm stuck here nothing's happening so suddenly like wow i can do this and actually a 40 mile you no know, consecutive 220 mile is, is is a hell of achievement over quite hard terrain as you rightly say suddenly why can't i go and do what i can do i'm not i can do anything sure you know? yeah 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 exactly um yeah, totally amazed. So, yeah. Excellent. So, and your third act of random kindness that you've experienced. So really you've you've experienced, you know, the second one was you giving to somebody else. So the first one was you kind of taking but both, both and then the third one is going to be what, what's your third act of random kindness that you've received? Or given? I think my third act of random kindness, I mean there's been loads, but this one, because I'm going to see this person again and even that is amazing but um I the day I left Plymouth to head towards Cornwall I um I got a message from a guy saying I've been following you for a while uh I'm on holiday in Lou which is pretty much the first port of call from Plymouth in Cornwall mm. and that's where I was kind of aiming to get to and I said oh well, right uh thanks for following me that's really nice he said but i just thought that would be it you know and he said oh, i'd really like to meet with you and walk with you for a day if you wouldn't mind yeah sure that sounds great not a problem you know it's quite nice every now and again to have someone with you for a day a bit of banter and a chat and whatever anyway he bought loads of food with him and um drinks and stuff for both of us which was kind enough but um why did it? he walked to I can't remember the place uh, Paul Perro with me and we sat and he bought me a pint in the uh, Blue Peter pub and then he said um, well I can't go much further today because I can only get a bus from here back to where I'm staying but um, where are you headed to and I was like well ideally I'd like to get to at least 40 um, and, I, so, and, I, and he said that's fine you go to 40 and I'll come and pick you up in 40 and then I'll drop you back there tomorrow. You can stay with us, me and my wife. And I was like, but you're on holiday. I can't do that. This is your time away. That's, that's really kind, but you know, that, it's fine, it's your time. And he said, no, nope. I'm picking you up at four. And he took me back to their place and then fed me and everything, washed my clothes and stuff and just gave me a shower and everything. And I just thought, you know, loads of people, it's easy for people that own a bakery or a sandwich shop to say, oh, here's a bit of food. Yeah. But he's taken time out of his holidays, one holiday of the year with his wife, to let me crash for the night and entertain me. And I just thought it was an amazing thing. And so he lives up just past Blackpool. And um, I'm heading that way, obviously. So I'll be coming to see him. And he said, uh, he'll put us up there and, and everything, as long as restrictions allow and stuff. Fantastic. That's good. That's brilliant. That's good three random acts of random kindness, you know. Okay. One walking tip that you'd pass on to any of our listeners, stroke watchers who are watching on YouTube. There's one walking tip that you could pass on to anybody who walks for two miles or 200 miles. What would that one tip be? Don't overthink it. Don't worry about it. Just go. Um, doesn't matter if it's two miles or 20 miles or 50 miles, whatever. Don't overthink it. You'll just, in, just enjoy it and you'll get there. It would be fine. You know, you're designed to do it. It's, um, it's something we've lost connection with and lost touch with properly but you know for thousands of years we've walked much much further than we ever do now um, and the option is so easy not to walk now because you get in your car or you can get on your bike or you know get on a train or a bus or get on those weird hoverboard type things i keep seeing uh, <laughs> or electric scooters now that that's the thing in my city since i've come home it, you know like a pay for it's got like it must be on an app and you can hire it from one part of the city and you just scoop it's just we've found so many ways not to naturally exercise 
it's not good for us. I think just go for a walk and don't think about it. All right. So just just do whatever you're going to do. Don't overthink it. Don't overplan it. But just do yeah. it. Yeah. Just do it. Definitely. Excellent. You should work in our office, you know, Chris. You could motivate them all, you know. It's... <laughs> I once had this. I've never mentioned this podcast. I was once interviewed on another podcast, and um, it was a more a business podcast. And uh, they actually they led it by something I wrote. We have big whiteboards in our office um, with, with our objectives and our targets and things. And one month, a few years ago, I just had enough of it all. I just had enough, so I wrote up at the top just effing do it <laughs> so, uh, with an epic explanation mark because I was fed up of excuses and a bit of like, mm, we could do this we could do this I just wrote the top your motto for this month is just effing do it so <laughs> yeah. well you're right though because we all make excuses about not yeah. doing something don't we but, and we but all it's... wait for things to be perfect when nothing's ever going to be perfect you know it's never going to be the right weather yeah. as you found you walk 20 days you look at the weather forecast put it in your diary just do it so you know what yeah. you might not know how to use your gps unit but you learn when you do it you might not know how to yeah. x y z just learn as you do it and then you get to the end and go actually next time i might do it a little bit different yeah. rather than over planning it um yeah just just do it isn't it okay moving on what top tip or what piece of kit would you recommend what's the piece of kit that if i said i if i'm going to take this off you go no 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 you're not going to take this off me what piece of kit would you <laughs> hate me to take off you before you continue on with your walk well you know it's funny you say that because i think you're wearing the rab nexus hoodie <laughs> right now it's yes, well spotted and I've got one and I absolutely love it. I have, it is so lightweight and warm, it's incredible. Um, I don't know if it's my favorite bit of kit, but for value for money and to have it and feel, cause you know, good kit, we all, we can be kit geeks or whatever, but we all love a good bit of kit. And the truth is that kit, if it's really good, it performs well, it gives you a sense of confidence. Mm -hmm. and. And that is what that Rab Nexus hoodie does for me. I've got the pullover and I've got the hoodie and I only wear the hoodie when I'm walking. And um, I just love it. It's absolutely brilliant. I would be pretty upset if someone tried to take it away from me. However, I recently got the Garmin an Instinct, Instinct Solar. Solar. Do you know, I noticed as you were saying, I nearly commented earlier on, is that an Instinct Solar on your wrist? Well, that's a bit nerdy, it is, isn't it, really? Yeah. But uh, the Garmin, was this a Christmas present or was this something that you got? Do you know, I've been sent loads of stuff since being at home in lockdown, just randomly by people mm -hmm. that have been following me. So a guy sent me this just because he's not using it and it was a present to him and he didn't want to see it go to waste. So he said, if it's beneficial, take it. So I was like, oh, of course, I'll take it. Great. Um, <laughs> and then a guy last week sent me the osprey ether 70 backpack which is what i said earlier i'm, I'm upgrading it to a, that size which is, is amazing because they're like uh, nearly 250 quid you know mm -hmm. and he just said again like i've used it twice but i'm not using it so you might as well take it and get get some use out of it it's really kind but yeah this um is amazing to get a watch that's going to last me 25 30 days or whatever without having to be recharged Mm -hmm. And actually, I've tested that recently. The battery life is immense. And as long as you actually have it out in the sun every day, it's incredible. And the capability is that it's got so many different functions to it. I do love it. Yeah. Have you, have you learned how to use it yet or not? Are you, I haven't uh, learned a single thing about how to use it yet. I know it's got storm alerts. It's got navigation and tracking. It's got all sorts of stuff. Well, when you come off, when I, when I come off the podcast, I'll email you some free access to our online training course. And there are, I think there's 40 videos of how to use the Garmin Instinct GPS units. So if you've got time to kill, Chris, you can uh, di dive all to yourself into there. And uh, again, my colleague Andy did all the training videos for the Instinct and he to be honest with you, he had a Phoenix. People know the podcast will know the story. He had a Phoenix. And when we gave him the instinct to do the training videos, he fell so much love into his, his uh, instinct. He sold his Phoenix and uh, ended up with an instinct GPS watch instead. So he, ah. he's, uh, so that's the story. And, and, and the instinct is quite funny because then the instinct that people see in the online resource was sat in our office. My son, who's now in his early 20s, a couple of years ago, he saw it in the office and said, that's really nice, like, can, I, can I wear it? And I went, yeah, of course you can. It's just, it was actually Garmin's watch. Uh, and I had to prize it off his wrist about a month later to return it back to Garmin because he's going, this is so cool. And I went, okay, can I have it back, please, Harry? He went, no, 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 no. <laughs> They are cool, though. I mean, I think 
they're really rugged, but they're so light as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't feel like it, it looks massive, but it's it's not a heavy weight on my wrist. It's yeah, lovely bit of kit. Very good, excellent. So you're uh, you give me three. Well, actually, you've flowed onto the, the well, no. You, so your three piece of kit is your rab top that's because you're modeling yourself and i'm wearing it you've got the osprey rucksack which somebody else gave you and then your your phoenix um instinct no, so your instinct solar watch is, is, is yeah okay one navigational tip that you would give anybody when walking i suppose it's kind of easy for you really just keep the sea on your left do you really is that it <laughs> but it is, although I've been giving talks on navigation and various other things to scout groups and guide groups while I've been at home in lockdown, um, just as a way of kind of keep the fundraising momentum going and stuff like that. And one thing that I notice when they're looking at maps and when they're telling me about how they would do things is they rarely look up. And I, I would probably say one of the best tips, it doesn't matter how good a map reader you are, you've got to keep looking up ahead. Because if you don't, how can you relate and translate the ground to the map and vice versa? You know, there are a reason there are contour lines, for example, because a map is flat, but actually it's telling you that the terrain is 3D. And you, if you look up, you'll see just where you are on the map. You know, it's much, much easier and quicker if you can do that. And that's the same for using a GPS or whatever. I, did, I saw your video recently of the... The new car that looks amazing, by the way. Which one's this? And the Montana Seven Hundred was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the screen on that is just great. It's phenomenal. It is. It's a good piece of kit. It is. So yeah, it's a, it's a. I, I'm, I've fallen in love with the Montana Seven Hundred actually since, uh, since okay. I've been walking with. It. I think it's a, it's a great piece of kit. So uh, I'm out with another one this weekend, but it's going to be hard. It's like it's like having a relationship with somebody. I don't want to have a relationship when I buy the Montana 700, <laughs> isn't it? Really is kind of... <laughs> Everybody on YouTube says, John, do a review on this. I'm like, oh, this is like taking... No, I don't want to. I want to just go out with the Montana. But no, I'm going to be professional and pick up what the customers are asking me to pick up and do a yeah. review on it. So uh, it's uh, there's some great kit around now. Children in need. I'm, I'm, before we head on to when you're going back out, children in need is that you're raising money. I must say, we saw you on Children Need Night on the television. I was sat down with my glass of wine. I must say we're teetotal now, we're in lockdown. We don't drink during life. But at the time we weren't in lockdown, I sat down with my glass of wine on a Friday night and uh, watching Children Need. I went, there's Chris. Hey, hey. <laughs> so yeah, all you were... of about three seconds. <laughs> well, I was impressed. I just recorded it and framed it. So yeah, you end up on Children Need. How much have you raised so far? Um, I think you've completely bamboozled what you were aiming to do. I think you had one big sponsor came along and doubled it overnight, didn't you? I think uh, they did. A, yeah. yeah, pretty much. Bam Clothing have been amazing and they've been really supportive ever since, actually. They're just, and they're a great company. Um, every now and again, I'll just get a text from them saying, hope you're doing all right. And, and that, there's there's no requirement from me. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just a, a lovely, lovely company. But um, yeah, so I am just shy of £23,000 now, I think. Wow. Okay. And what were you aiming originally? And I mean, I like the, the figure. What was your original objective? So I set my target at ten thousand pounds. Okay. And for various reasons, one, I had to stick something in the box. But mm -hmm. two, I, I don't know a lot about social media. I was never confident I'd be able to get much attention because I, I'm doing everything myself whilst I'm walking, and the last thing I want to do at night is in my tent try and send out press releases or whatever. Um, but, you know, the whole thing has evolved from me just starting a Facebook page and having an Instagram and a YouTube and a Twitter thing, which I still don't know how to use any of them. But it's evolved further in that, I, you know, my website's become more of a blog and I'm writing all about my experiences and other things. And people are noticing that more and putting that out and people contacted me because of that and suddenly want to donate or want me to do things. I've given talks to scout groups, like I've said, to and I do those for free. Um, and if they want to give a donation, they can. But recently I've been giving talks to businesses and companies about motivation and perseverance. And they're, they're donating like a fee almost, um, which is awesome. It's a totally different direction that my, I'd intended for this part of my life to have. But um, that in itself is pretty incredible. Um, yeah, so the whole thing has just evolved from me deciding I wanted to go for a bit of a walk to this great big snowballing 
bizarre. You say you're not really you you've done so much on social media. You know, we all appreciate it. You know, we followed you. I I actually sat down night before last and said to my wife, I'm spend a spent a couple of hours. I'm speaking to Chris on Thursday. I did spend a couple of hours just trawling through his gear and uh, yeah. there's so much stuff. Do you know, I just kind of went, oh, where do you start, Chris? Man, it's like yeah. so much content on your Facebook page and your social media. It's just like oh my okay right there's this so you have and you can see that develop over the time as well you know the first few you know, youtubes you're like <laughs> but then you get better you got better and better at it which is is practice yeah. so uh i think and 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 you show quite a, a, a nice insight into that you know, that world and 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 i think you've learned not to overthink it because you you can overthink things yeah. going. <laughs> And also, I think I've learned to not take myself so seriously and just try and enjoy it a bit because yeah. the truth is, it's not a big, you know, I, I'm not some corporate advertiser. I'm not some product that people have invested millions of pounds in and I'm worried about the return on investment or whatever. I'm just out there doing what I can to raise money for a charity. And then, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's lovely that people are following me. I never expected to get as many followers as I have. And I think that's still growing. And, mm -hmm. but it's just amazing isn't it the power of this stuff I mean I, I've walked all over the world and, I, and done lots of different things and when I've been traveling in the past I remember traveling in India and Thailand for example I didn't have a mobile phone let alone access to 3G or 4G internet it just didn't exist so now it's like can you imagine if I had documented my row in the Atlantic via social media it, it would have been insane but it just couldn't happen. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's fascinating. And all from a, a phone you just have in your hand or however you're doing it, it's like, it's, it's just this one device, which you sit there going, you know, it's just, it's mind blowing, really. It's just mind blowing with the technology you have in there that you could do a live stream or you, however you, you want to do it. And it's just there in your pocket, isn't it? Yeah. And in all the time I've been walking, I've had, I had four consecutive days without signal, but that's it. Right. Yeah. Wow. But they were good four days as well. They've been enjoyable days, those without the mobile phone signal, was it? <laughs> they were great. The only problem with it was that my wife was worried because obviously she didn't know if something had happened to me or where mm -hmm. I was. But I'd, I'd anticipated at certain points there might be comms blackouts type of thing. And, mm -hmm. and I'd said just, you know, we had a procedure, so it wasn't quite ready for her to sort of ring the authorities or rescue people so it was fine <laughs> and when are you hoping to head out again then what's the time scale of um of, of, now we kind of got wales so, gear the lockdown out this last week i think haven't they and we kind of know where we stand in england have you got a date penciled in the diary yeah so my date is the 12th of april um i'll be leaving home on the 12th um which is good because it means i get to spend the easter half term with the kids as well they get used to going back to school and then I'm away again. And they're kind of, they've got it in their heads that that's what's happening now. Um, but it also means I get to spend my birthday with them and my wife before I go. Um, my ideal is to head straight back to Aberystwyth. However, if Wales keeps saying no to tourists from England, I will go further north in England somewhere. And what I'm likely to do is reverse so I'll go, I'll head back to Wales. So I've done that section. And then what I'll do is I'll drive or get a train or get someone to give me a lift back to where I started from. So I'm thinking of starting sort of Blackpool or Fleetwood area. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's just logically. It's just the Welsh can't make the mind up what they're doing, can they? Really? Yeah, it's such a shame as well, because do you know what? It, it's such a vast country and there's so few people in it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know, it was it was uh, going back to your 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 escape from Wales. That was such an exciting night. Your live social media as you were oh. leaving Wales. It was like uh, it was this kind of um, yeah. I remember it well. It was a Saturday night. It was wet and horrible here, and uh, and um, yeah, it was like Chris was escaping uh, Wales because the whole thing was like the whole country was just changing that night, wasn't it? And it was like it just it was, went you, mad like that. I remember getting out of the hotel and, and I. I, I knew where the train station was in my head because I'd sort of made a mental note of it earlier in the day. And uh, the weird thing was, I got out of the hotel, you know, I'm rushing to the train station, but the streets went mad. There were people everywhere. They were obviously panic buying or just running into shops. 
And I thought, God, this is a nightmare. Did we not learn from the first lockdown that we don't need to do this? Because again, in my head, I was just thinking, it's only going to be a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, oh, it, we're now a year, over a year, we've had these rolling lockdowns and various problems. Um, it was a strange, I was never really scared, but the truth of the situation is I came into contact with more people coming home that night than I would have if I'd just been allowed to stay in my house. Uh, and that's what annoys me a little bit. You know, I could, I would now be somewhere in Scotland, most likely, and I'd have been on track to finish in a year. I now have a decision to make about whether I discount this period of lockdown from the total running days around the country, which I'm in my head, I'd like to, because it will still give me a potential opportunity to get around in a year. Mm -hmm. But the reality is it has affected my life further down the line because it means I will finish later than I'd intended. Yeah. 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 Good. So how can people support you, Chris? And how can people find out more about uh, where, what you're up to? So it's like really social media and um, just giving page and this kind of thing. Yeah. Get straight to my website, thecoastwalker.com. There's a buy me a coffee link. There's all my social media links on there, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, I write a blog on there weekly as well at the moment. Um, you can contact me via email through there as well. And the other thing you could, do is follow children in need in some way because i'm on their pages fairly regularly at the moment which is cool uh, i'm also giving a talk um i don't know if you i completely forgot about this i should have told you but um <laughs> i think <laughs> i think it's on the 29th of march and it's via a facebook group page there's quite a pe quite a few people that have attend uh, clicks that, that they're attending i can't remember the name of the page i think it's distance hiking uk okay Right. Tell you what, if you send me that link afterwards, I will put it in the show notes. Yeah. Um, and it is going to be, this is actually going to go out um, the middle of April. So I'll also put it in the newsletter. So uh, so for, like, right, cool. in the next week, um, uh, I'll be in next week's newsletter and then that will tie in with it. Because um, again, Perfect. when when people are going to be listening to this, you're actually just going to be, I mean, maybe actually put it on the 12th of April, maybe just starting your walk again. Because uh, it's yeah. in the middle of April by when this gets uh, launched, so you'll be just about heading out at that point. But I'll put I, I'll put something in the newsletter about the on the 29th of March, and then people can listen to then. So it gives you a bit of a gets them a bit of a warm up. Anything Excellent. else you want to add before we finish, Chris? Anything you want? Any other pearls of wisdom or anything you would like to uh, share with our listeners on the GPS Training Podcast? No, well, not really. I mean, I'd like. <laughs> I'm not a font of all knowledge or uh, anything, but I, to be honest, I'm looking forward to just getting up in your way and uh, meeting you up, meeting up with you for a walk and a beer. And um, I think that was promised last time. So. It certainly is. <laughs> I think we should. I'm gonna come over to Cumbria with you. When you're in Cumbria, I'll come and walk a stretch of Cumbria with you. And then when you come in the uh, the Northumberland, well. Scottish borders, Northumberland coast. I'll maybe walk down the um, the north. Well, that's going to be my 125 mile walk. Is actually from uh, Newcastle upon Time up to top, well, into Scottish borders up the Northumberland coast. So, uh, oh, lovely. When gonna, is that? That's going to be October. So that's my October walk. So I, I, I yeah. So I don't know. Um, I might be past there by then, but mm -hmm. so we do yeah, a training walk. Yeah, train walk in May. I'm going to do 67 miles in 24 hours on St Cuthbert's Way in one go. I am in May. That's my plan there. So. And are you or are you um, camping or are you staying in places or uh, just just sleep? Just no, don't camp. Just all in one go. I'm not going to stop. I'm, I am going to stop. I'll just stop in uh, for 67 miles. I'm doing that totally unsupported. So I will just like lie down for an hour or two, which is what I did last time. Um, but when I do my 125 miles, I've got a friends with a motorhome, which I'll sleep on the floor in the motorhome for two, two hours maximum, really two hours each night. I, I tend to yeah, sleep. Yeah, yeah. That's my, uh, that's my theory. I know last time I did an hour sleep, um, which really wasn't enough. And then I did an hour and a half on the floor of the motorhome later on. I had like what, two and a half hours sleep. The first hour was pretty awful, to be honest. Uh, but say this time I'll have to, it was two days. I'm going to hopefully have two um, staggered. I think two stage. hours is about right. Yeah, I think two, any longer than that would probably be too much. It is. And going back to your diet thing, I, I, I learned as well to eat before you sleep. That was my biggest mistake. I, I slept on an empty stomach, hungry in the early hours of the morning, got up and tried to eat porridge. Uh, yeah. which, and then went. I was out walking within eight minutes after eating my porridge. 
where in hindsight, if I'd ate before I went to sleep, my body would have recovered with the food, going back to our earlier conversation, and I would have woken up. Because actually, after the first hour, I didn't, I actually felt worse than I did before I went to sleep. So in yeah. hindsight, I should have ate, slept, and carried on walking. Um, but we learn these things, don't we? So, uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. So thank you very much, Chris, for joining me on this month's GPS show. It's really good to catch up with you. Um, Again, if we do, well, we will walk together in the lake. So we might have to do a walk and talk actually as we're doing it. We'll, I'll bring my uh, microphone and we can walk and record lots and then edit it down into something that hopefully makes it a bit of sense because it can't be a bit of a, a walk and talk because we all open up a little bit more when we're walking, don't we? Yeah, that sounds great. We'll hope for a non-windy day then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a little muff thing on the top of my oh, on my recorder so because uh, I've done quite a few in the past. So, yeah, fingers crossed we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get some there. So thank you very much for joining me on this month's gps training podcast cool thank you very much nice to see you john